Okay, good morning and uh, welcome everyone. We continue with uh, First Peter chapter five, and then we will uh, switch on to Second Peter chapter one today. Let's pray and let's begin today's class. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to uh, Lord dwell in your Word. Thank you that your Word, O oh God. Uh, Lord transforms us, strengthens us, and God, even the unfinished parts of us, so oh God, thank you, Lord, that as we engage in your word, that God, you are forming something wonderful in each one of us, Father. You're making us, O oh God, into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for every opportunity to engage in your word. We bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, so let's uh, get back to First Peter chapter five. We read through the whole chapter, and uh, we did the first section there, where we said that you know Peter is exhorting the pastors or the elders of the church to take care of God's flock, and he says that the Lord Jesus is the chief shepherd. So we have someone who is our role model when it comes to taking care of God's people. We saw the kind of heart, the attitude that one needs to have in order to take care of God's people. That one shouldn't be like a lord over God's people, but be an example, have an eager spirit, uh, and not have personal agenda, but genuinely want to care and uh, see the growth and you know expansion of God's kingdom. Now. Coming to the next section here, he's calling the believer to live a life submitted to God. And uh, the key to overcoming the enemy in our lives is firstly submission to God. So when we talk about spiritual warfare, we generally quote right uh, the uh, scripture where we say, you know, resist the devil. He will flee from you. Uh, resist him steadfast in the faith. Over here, verse 9. You know, it says, uh, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But while resisting him is a part of what we need to do, you know, firstly, Peter talks about, you know, being submitted to God and uh, having a humble attitude. Uh, so a uh, very oft repeated scripture we find it here in first peter chapter 5 and verse 5 where he says likewise you younger people submit yourselves to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble so he's teaching us about submission submission overall of course to god uh, but then Submission also to those in authority, elders refers to those in authority, uh, and one another, meaning the fellowship of believers, the brotherhood. So being submitted to God, being submitted to elders, being submitted to the to the uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, that demonstrates our humility. We're walking in humility, clothed with humility, or having an attitude of humility. And he says, that when we do have humility, what is it that we can receive from God? We receive grace from God. And so humility is demonstrated in our attitude. Humility helps us receive more grace from God. And verse 6, we see that when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, an exaltation. Uh, is expected. So God himself will exalt us in due time. So there is a right time when we can see God uh, bringing us, you know, in, in, a, in a place where uh, there is honor on our lives. So we just have to, it's not that we should go looking for that honor. No, there is a right time when God himself will do it for us when we are walking in humility. And so that trust in God is essential. Dependence on God is essential. So he's teaching us about 
you know, submission. He's teaching us about humility. He's teaching us about trusting God. He says in verse 7, cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. So trust in God wholeheartedly. And when we do this, you know, we are in a better position to resist the devil. Uh, and, and then, you know, he says, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks a about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we understand that Satan uses, uh, we, we've seen this, we've discussed it in the book of James, how there are external influences. He tries to attract us uh, with what the world has to offer to us. He influences us from the outside, which can lead to an oppression if we give in to uh, Satan. But also there are things of the flesh within us you know, that if we don't deal with, Whatever you tolerate will dominate, is, is what you know a, a court says. So if we tolerate the fleshly uh, uh, aspects in us, then what happens is they may begin to dominate us. And so here, Peter is telling us that we should be sober. What is sober? You know, sober is somebody who's in their right mind, who has a balanced way of thinking, who's not drunk, who's not under the influence of uh, alcohol. So sober, generally we, we refer to sober as that. So sober is being in our right mind or being very balanced, being without any excesses, you know, avoiding excesses in our lives where we are moderate. Um, we are uh, in check. We are in self-control. So who, a believer who is like that, who is living their lives, uh, you know, committed to the word and very alert, sober, be vigilant. Vigilant is again alert. When we are balanced in our mind, when we uh, are able to think correctly, uh, and that also actually shows alertness. But he, he adds and he says, be alert. So when um, a believer is in self-control, a believer is alert, then it's very difficult for Satan to get us. And he's calling Satan adversary. Adversary is an opponent. So obviously Satan, no suggestion of the enemy is going to benefit us because he's the enemy and he's our adversary. So he's like a roaring lion and uh, it is his duty. He's taken it as his duty to bring down, uh, you know, people. And so as a believer, we maintain that po posture of self-control, of alertness, so that we can resist him. And then, you know, he says resist him. So once we are in submission, once we are in humility, you know, once we are trusting in the Lord and we are walking correctly, you know, under self-control and alertness, then it's easy to take over the enemy. And he says, Faith. Faith is another characteristic. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So to have confidence uh, in, in God and know that whatever I'm going through is not unique. Many people have been through it, but they have overcome by the power of God. And so even I can overcome. And Obviously, you know, he's speaking to persecuted believers. So sufferings, they understand what he's talking about. And he's saying, don't worry. Whatever is happening, trust in the Lord. Even in the time of persecution, many of you are going through uh, all these matters, but God is there. He will help. And then he, he uh, exhorts God in the next two verses. He says, but may the God of all grace, God of all grace, what does it mean? God will, uh, God will pour out his grace on us. That's how we are going to get through anything in our lives. So the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. So very beautiful. God does not waste anything. Now, we don't say that God calls us to suffering and God wants to make people suffer so that they can become strong. Uh, you know, it, it's not like that. But we are living in this fallen world, uh, our God has this ability to use the sufferings, to use what we go through to, uh, as he says, perfect, established, strengthen. We've seen already how, you know, when we are waiting on the Lord, when we are suffering, it can build character in us. When we are patient, it can, it can form a more mature individual of us and so that's what he is referring to here and he's saying when we go through these matters 
thank god he has the ability to use even these sufferings to make us more mature perfect is nothing but mature and uh, with maturity comes establishing strength settle meaning there is a certainty about it there is a stability about it there is a firmness about it and with maturity you will receive that so your suffering will not be wasted just trust in god and you know you will resist the work of the opposer or the adversary who is satan and he says to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen so he's saying look we praise god because everything you know all things will work together for good to those who love the lord and who are called according to his purpose and that is our great god glory be to him you know dominion is his forever and ever amen so he's just worshiping god knowing that you know god is able to sustain us god is able to take care of us and the farewell message towards the end where he says by silvanus our faithful brother as i consider him i have written to you briefly so uh, commentators say that maybe this last section was written by peter himself till now uh, silas helped him to write out a, a, a wonderful literary piece because peter was a fisherman and he did he did not have the expertise to to uh, you know write an excellent uh, letter so silvanus helped him now a few lines possibly written by peter he says uh, i have written through the help of silvanus uh, but you know i i can i have written to you briefly exhorting you and testifying that this is the true grace of god in which you stand so he he is just encouraging the believer and he's saying you know god is with you uh, you are doing well in god and that's because of the grace of god and he brings a greeting to the churches remember we said that he speaks to the dispersion of the believers in asia minor the various churches and he brings a greeting he says she who is in babylon so what does it mean she so she uh, commentators say is uh, used for the bride uh, and who is the bride the church so peter is possibly talking about a local church so he's talking about a church she is a church a church who is in babylon babylon uh, now when we look at babylon here babylon may not you know at the time when uh, uh, the apostles lived it do, did not have the kind of significance of ancient babylon you know all the wickedness and the power that babylon carried in the ancient times uh, it it wasn't uh, that to the apostles but it was probably just referring to the place so he was probably writing from the physical city of babylon and he's just making a mention of it and there is a church in babylon so you know he's just writing from that physical city or some commentators say that he was probably referring to rome or jerusalem and the fact that a lot of uh, uh, ungodly things had taken over so he is he is sort of um, not literally but in a figurative way babylon refers to wickedness and evil so he was probably saying you know i'm i'm writing to you from a uh, from a wicked time or a difficult time and he was writing from rome or jerusalem and yet he chose to call the church as a church in babylon so this is the understanding of that portion uh, and he says elect together with you greets you and so does mark my son who is this mark mark is likely the writer of the book of mark john mark if you recall from the book of acts whom uh, paul was not very happy with a cousin of barnabas uh, but then mark went on to be one of the co-workers and co-co-laborers in the in the mission work of the apostles and uh, it seems like you know mark was engaging in excellent team work and even peter you see how beautifully uh, paul says you know bring mark along he's useful for me but peter says mark my son so uh, mark was serving together and serving faithfully is what we can understand so uh, you know he mentions these uh, map babylon and mark and then he says greet one another with a kiss of love so what does that mean it simply means they had a, a cultural way in which they used to 
greet one another with a kiss of love and so he's just promoting the same thing now i know times have changed we we have uh, uh, i mean we are just doing thumbs up and you know all those things on on zoom our ways of greeting have changed but well he just means that there needs to be the genuine love right so greet people with the love gesture can be modernized today i, I suppose and peace to you all who are in christ jesus amen so uh, that's like a standard love and peace that's what the apostles wanted for the people of god wanted for the churches so everywhere you see uh, let there be love let there be peace and today that's what we want for our churches as well the, the love of god among the brethren the peace of god ruling and reigning in our midst and so with that greeting peter wraps up the the first epistle so what do we see broadly in uh, the book of first peter we saw words of encouragement to believers who were suffering persecution and we also saw instructions for living in difficult times where um, there is a greater focus on submission you know submission to government submission to masters wives submit to your husbands and you know later on we we see how submit to to your elders submit to one another and uh, when we are living an orderly life so peter uh, talks about conduct behavior uh, and here and there he says look if this this uh, being born again experience has not changed our life if we are the same the way people of the world are then tell me like what what big difference uh, we have in the world so conduct behavior uh, is so very important and when a believer is living like this a transformed life the believer is impactful the believer god will you know um, uh, raise up that believer you humble yourself under the mighty hand of god and god will raise you up and live with the grace of god god's grace will enable you from uh, every side so that is broadly what this this uh, book is all about and we know this was written a little in the early uh, 60s uh, ad and then a little later on comes the second epistle of peter to the believers so now we can move on to the second epistle so this second epistle uh, again we we notice that uh, he probably wrote this but four to five years later to the churches uh, and the theme of this this particular letter initially it is about you know living a, a a life of faith with great stability how to have that life of stability right faith and stability so he'll he'll talk about that and then he'll go on to warning the believers about um, ungodly people just the way jude we saw in the book of jude where he talks about those false teachers and false prophets and you know people who are coming to deceive the body of christ so it begins with talking about stability as a believer and then it goes on to addressing the people of god to be warned about these ungodly men and women who can uh, distract the believer so chapter 2 and 3 will mostly be about that so today we'll look at chapter 1 and we'll see what we can learn from here so first we'll have to read through it it's kind of long uh, there are 21 verses if it is possible for three of us to read 7 7 verses uh, that would be fantastic second peter chapter 1 verse 1 Simon Peter a born servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and savior Jesus Christ grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust but also for this very reason giving all diligence add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge self control to self control perseverance to perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love amen thank you roslyn uh, another person could kindly read the next seven verses to godliness brotherly kindness and to uh, brotherly kindness love for if these things are yours and abound you will be neither barren for nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ for he who lacks these things is short sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things you will never stumble for so so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ for this reason i will not be negligent uh, to remain to remind you always of these things true although you know and are established in the present truth yes i think it is right as long as i am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you knowing that shortly i must put off my tent just as our lord jesus christ showed me thank you sally another person please moreover i will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our lord jesus christ but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received from god the father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain and so we have the prophetic word confirm which you do which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit amen thank you thank you subhashish so let's uh, now get in to this chapter second peter chapter 1 we uh, as i told us this was written a little later uh, in the 60s 60 ad so uh, somewhere around 65 to 68 ad is the date that uh, this book this chap this uh, epistle was written and uh, it is said that it was written during the rule and reign of uh, nero so nero ruled in uh, 68 ad uh, that's when you know actually uh, peter wrote this now in verse 14 if you noticed he says something like knowing that shortly i must put off my tent tent referring to his body so he's while writing this letter he knew that this was the last letter that he is writing so he saying i'll put off my tent the persecution was so intense that peter knew that very soon he would um, be martyred and that's exactly what happened peter was martyred uh, at ad 69 so you know look at the journey of peter if you remember in the book of acts he was put in jail and after james it was his turn but god protected him so many times why why didn't he get protected now uh, you know we we really don't have answers to those questions uh, but it's likely that 
Peter fulfilled the purpose that God had for him. And he himself knew that the time is coming up. And uh, this time around, I will put off my tent. Meaning, he would, uh, you know, he, he would uh, die or be martyred. So this is a little bit of the timeline of when this was written. So he begins with the greeting. He says, Simon Peter, bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So some com commentators say the order in which he uh, you know, puts these words, both are descriptions of who he is. Uh, and uh, in those days, you know, doulos or the Greek word bond servant, it's, it's a term that is used to describe a slave for life, somebody who does not have anything else and no agenda, nothing. You have a master and your life is all about that master. And uh, it's it's amazing how even Jude, right? Like James, um, we see these, these ministers of God, even Paul, like some, he uses this term bond servant, where Peter, you know, he realizes that's, that's the goal of his life. I'm living for my master the Lord Jesus. And before he says apostle, you know, somewhere we may draw our identity from our calling or the, the office of an apostle. That sounds more glamorous, right, compared to bond servant. But the mindset that the apostles had, they were very committed to, to serving God no matter what. And so, you know, the order, he first says bond servant, then he says apostle of Jesus Christ. And uh, remember, this Peter is somebody who walked with Jesus. Uh, now, Paul, yeah, Paul did not have those natural experiences uh, with uh, Jesus, but Peter has seen it all. Peter was there with Jesus when the miracles took place. You know, uh, Peter was there when, when Jesus was, was being beaten. Uh, and so he, he, even experientially, who Jesus was, right? Like his knowing of Jesus had that additional aspect to it. And knowing Jesus, uh, he's, he's saying, look, I am the bond servant of, of the son of God or this man of God. And I am the apostle. And that kind of, an, of a commitment he displayed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, to those who have obtained like precious faith, with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Obtain like precious faith. What is that? See, we know that faith, you know, that initial initial uh, uh, unction of faith that we receive is from the Lord. So he says, we've all received. We've received faith from our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is so precious because everything in the kingdom works by faith. And uh, one must remember that as a believer. And we've all obtained like precious faith, right? Because of the work that Jesus has done on the cross. And he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So it's a common greeting when people say this. Even today, many people write like this when they write emails, letters. They say, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Uh, and it's beautiful that we can have grace, which is the ability to serve, the ability to do things for God. And peace, you know, experience shalom of God. Uh, but how can we have more of this, more of grace, more of peace through the knowledge of God in our lives? So as we get to know God more, align our lives more and more to God, we'll have you know more of his grace, we'll have more of his peace. And he goes on to say, uh, the next section there, verses 3 and 4, he teaches us how we can live a godly life and how we can escape the corruption in the uh, world. Because it's a wicked world that we live in. But we are called to live holy lives for Jesus Christ. So he says, his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So how can I live a holy life? God has given us his divine power. Right? And what does that power have? That power... Uh, which pertain to life and godliness. So whatever we need for life, whatever we need for godly living, through the power of God, it can be our portion. And he also says, uh, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So 
the knowledge of God, right? That is what is connected with the power of God working in our lives. And he also makes a reference to the great and precious promises, exceedingly great and precious promises of God. So we have all this. We have the power of God. You know, we have uh, the knowledge of God. And we also have his great promises in our lives. Now, by all these things, things he says we can become partakers of the divine nature of god so we can partake of the divine nature of god it's not like god is calling us to be holy and not providing us with what we need to be holy isn't it if that was the case then we have every every excuse is valid but then he says no look god has given you his divine power you have what you need through the knowledge of god and the precious promises now, through these things, I can partake of the divine nature. What is the divine nature like? You know, righteous, holy, just, uh, loving, kind, uh, everything. We can be partakers of the divine nature, right? And when we are walking in the spirit, as you know, Paul said, we overcome the flesh. So when we are walking in holiness and righteousness, we are already escaping. Right? The corruption, the evil, the wickedness of the world. So God has empowered us. In other words, he says, in a tough time like this, God has empowered us to live for him. And we can live as overcomers. And now he teaches the believer how to, um, you know, how to be mature and how to have a fruitful life in God. So he lists out uh, in, in some places... Like we had done a sermon series here in APC called the seven spices. So there are these seven spices. Uh, no time to talk about each spice individually. So we'll put it together and make one curry today. Okay, quickly. And we'll just talk about all the seven spices that God wants for us as believers in our character. And, uh, you know, main thing is we need to incorporate them. Right. So what are these, these spices that we need? So he says... Giving all diligence. Diligence is um, we we are keenly putting in hard work. We are we are committedly on that work, right? So that is diligence. So giving all diligence meaning be serious about this. Work on this. Add to your faith virtue. So first is faith. First of all, what should a believer have? Our life must be marked by faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from the word of God. So as a believer, to abound in faith, right? Have faith in God. Keep strong faith in God day to day. Uh, and that is very necessary. So Peter emphasizes faith. He says, add to that virtue. So I can't just keep saying that, you know, I have faith and that's about it. And I don't have anything else. But he says, virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is character. Okay, Having the right character. And we can speak so many things about character, isn't it? To have the right heart, the right motivation. So virtue is that. The right character, good character. So he says, along with faith, imagine a believer who, who, who is developing in character. You know, becoming more like Christ. How beautiful it is. You have a lovely combination there. And he says, when virtue is there, let's add another thing. Right? What is that? He says, knowledge. Don't be lacking in knowledge. We may grow in our faith. We grow in our virtue. But then if we become weak in our knowledge of God, meaning we, we are not, um, you know, uh, uh, developing our it's not when he says knowledge it's not just got to do with intellectual knowledge but the knowing of god you know uh, in terms of the uh, the word in experientially in knowledge right and experiencing god so he says have faith have virtue have knowledge and then he says have self control how beautiful it will be for a believer who's growing like this right having these elements and also having self control self control we see this in the fruit of the spirit uh, it's a demonstration of that kind of maturity. So self-control for a believer. Self-control in what areas? You know, self-control can be in our thought life. It can be in our um, 
uh, you know, in our appetites. Uh, it can be in the way we speak. When we saw James, you know, James talked about the tongue and how one should speak edifying words. Uh, and, uh, you know, the tongue needs to be tamed. And so there is, there is exercise of self-control in the way we speak. So in all these aspects, when one is demonstrating self-control, that is a sign of maturity. It's like a well-rounded, all-round believer. So self-control is a part of that believer's life. He says perseverance. So uh, that's, again, you know, it, it makes for such a mature believer. So self-control. And then perseverance is to have patience, to endure you know, the way the book of Hebrews talks about it, that we, we endure, we overcome suffering, keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord, knowing that when we go through whatever it is right now, God will bring us out. He will bring us out with a reward. So believer who's able to persevere, right? And to that, he says, godliness. Godliness is holy living. Okay, so holiness, uh, um, worship unto the Lord. So living our lives as worship unto the Lord uh, with holiness, uh, uh, okay, and righteousness and all of that. Then godliness, he says, add brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness has to do with extending grace and extending, you know, genuine love for the people of God who are in our lives. So brotherly kindness, it's more the relational aspect of it. So far, we talked about a personal, you know, uh, uh, personal things that we need to have. But here, something relational, brotherly kindness. And he says, finally, to that, you, know, you add love. Now, I know I've, I've put it all in a very small nutshell. But uh, as I stated earlier, we've done a seven part series over seven Sundays. So uh, or maybe, you know, slightly lesser Sundays. But there's so much more that we can gain out of each of these elements that uh, as a believer, we must grow in and have all these facets in our lives. Because it's important. We can't just say, okay, I'm a believer. I have faith. And that's it. Don't ask me. Right? About holy living, don't ask me. About relating rightly with other believers, don't ask me. We can't say that. We need to be well-rounded. So what is the advantage of being well-rounded and mature like this? He adds a few more benefits. So from verse 8, he says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are saying that we are growing in God. We are learning more about God. But how can that be done well? Okay, how can we avoid, uh, you know, some lacunae there or some some blur in our knowledge of God? Uh, so for us not to be barren or unfruitful in getting to know God, we need all these elements. Right? So a believer is sincerely uh, trying to conform to the image of the Son of God. And then, you know, our growing in his knowledge also becomes very uh, effective. And he says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he, he was cleansed from his old sins. So it simply says that imagine, you know, as believers, we think that it's not important for us to be mature. We can just you know, do the Christian activities and uh, not really have any evidence in our lives. And it's okay. If we think like that, then he's saying uh, we don't we don't really understand the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And, you know, the way we have received forgiveness from God and the way our lives have changed now, we don't have a proper understanding of that. It's very light. You know, yeah, okay, I got, I am redeemed. But we we have not it it's not become a deep reality for us because we are so careless to to live our lives however we wish, right? So that's what he's saying. He's saying that is short sightedness. We've even forgotten, you know, how we were cleansed from our sins and how what a privilege it is that we are on the other side now. And it's not because of our good works. It's it's the grace of God. Right. So he's saying we, we, we are not taking it. Uh, we're not honoring the work of Jesus. We're not honoring the transformation that we've been through when we lack this kind of maturity. So, again, you know, the way the writer to the Hebrews was saying, be mature. By now, I wish all of you had grown up 
right that you may be able to teach to teach uh, others even peter is saying let's become mature you know believers uh, friends church let's rise up let's grow up in the lord be mature then verse 10 he says therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you, if you do these things you will never stumble for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ so it's similar to what hebrews says see we need to get to the finish line okay and uh, again this is not a promotion for salvation by works that's not what it is but what we are being warned of is if a believer is not going to um uh, yield to the conviction of the holy spirit then uh, you know like hebrew 6 and hebrew 10 we run the risk when we are willfully sinning willfully going away from god then he says you know make your call and election sure it's as if we we can even move away from the salvation there is that danger and remember that don't ever get into it and when we do finish the race well uh, then he talks about the reward that we have look at this it's so beautiful so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ you know many times painting the picture of the end is uh, what energizes us to run the race isn't it like so an athlete will think of the time when they when they um, run past that ribbon which is the finish line uh, for us as believers the thought of you know entering heaven with applause so ima you can imagine yourself where where jesus is uh, his happy smiling face and you know the host of heaven and loud applause because you finished you walked in an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ so when we've lived this this well rounded mature life and we make it to the finish line you know just imagine imagine you know how it will be to enter heaven having finished the race so he's he's helping the believer have hope you know towards that and then he main, mentions about uh, uh, the fact that he will soon be gone so from verses 12 to 14 uh, 12 to 15 he says i will um, i must put off this put off my tent just as our lord jesus christ showed me so he had a revelation that he's going to die soon he'll be martyred soon but knowing that he's going to be martyred what does he do he says i won't be negligent to remind you always so he doesn't feel bad to keep reminding hey believer you know uh, become mature be strong in god and that's important that's important so he says while i have little bit of time left here full reminders you know i'm sending you reminders so that you will never forget you will never forget even in verse 15 he says i will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease because this is so important believer you have to be strong you have to be well rounded you have to be mature i'll keep reminding you even my writings are going to keep reminding you after i am god and he also makes a mention of something special there at the end of verse 12 he says uh, though you know and are established in the present truth present truth what does that mean see present truth means that yeah we already have scripture we cannot have any new revelation outside of scripture isn't it uh, it has to be within scripture however in every given time and season there is something known as the present truth that means god is manifesting something or he is um, he is bringing that revelation to the body of christ in a deeper way in that time and season and the focus is on that subject that is the present truth okay so it's not outside of scripture but it's more like a highlight okay or the spotlight is on that for example acts 19 you know when paul he's talking to the ephesians he says uh, have you received the holy spirit and then they say what is the holy spirit we never even heard about the holy spirit so they didn't know 
whereas god was actually pouring out his spirit and people were being filled with it but this set of believers did not know the present truth and so he had to teach them about the baptism in the holy spirit so that is what he is saying that may god establish you in what he is doing right now you know in this time and season that is called as the present truth so we'll stop here you stopped at verse 15 uh, and we'll pick up from here tomorrow and uh, you know be able to uh, go over chapters 2 and 3 and we can complete so if there are any questions we can address them uh, if not we can pray and close okay uh, i think that was uh, you know quite uh, self explanatory whatever peter has written here so uh, let's pray then and uh, we can wrap up i want to request one of us on the call to lead us in prayer let's pray Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class that we had, and I thank you uh, for your precious word, Lord, which guides us, which fills us with your wisdom, which helps us to walk in victory in this life, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that everything that we learn, Lord, we will hold on in our life through the sufferings and through the joy. and through all the situations that we uh, go through all this life Jesus help us to be man and woman of your word who walk as the children of the light Lord for your kingdom we thank you for good wife and connection throughout the class we thank you for pastor Nancy and i thank you for all my classmates over here we just give you all the glory and all the honor because you deserve it Lord in Jesus name i pray amen And thank you, thank you, Jeffina. Thank you, everyone. Um, God bless you, and uh, all the best for your assignments. Uh, yours will be posted today, so you'll have sufficient time. It'll be more of a quiz, which you will be able to answer. So all the best, and God bless. Bye for now.